Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the first of a three-part webinar series providing insight into Florida's redistricting process. Part one will provide an overview of the redistricting process that takes place every 10 years and the impact it has on Florida's businesses. The discussion will include Florida's census data, population change, and the economic implications of redistricting. In part two, we will discuss the legislative session um, and the impact of, and highlight rather, the latest news relating to redistricting. And finally, part three will take place at the end of the legislative session in March and will detail the final maps agreed to by the legislature and outline the next steps. So just to recap that, so today we're going to discuss the census data. In January, we're going to discuss where we are in the process as it relates to the maps and building the maps. And part three, in March, we're going to discuss the final maps and the next steps following that. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All of the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so free, feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them to the Q&A engagement tool. We will try to answer these questions during the webcast. However, if you want a fuller answer and you feel that one is needed, um, or we run out of time, feel free to send us an email and we will respond um, to your question or we will notice that and then capture that question and email you a response later. A copy of today's slide deck and links are available in the related content tool. We encourage you to download the presentation or links that you may find useful. You can find additional answers to some common technical questions located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after today's webcast under Gunster's videos and webinars page, as well as Gunster's YouTube channel. So once again, thank you for joining us and welcome. I am joined by my colleagues, Joanna Bonfanti and Kevin Cleary, and we will together guide the conversation this morning. So let me begin by going through what the census data um, that was collected um, means for Florida. What does Florida look like in uh, 2020 versus 2010? So let's start by talking about the population growth. Florida's population has grown by 14.6% um, since 2010 and to more than 21.5 million people. So when you think about uh, that length of time, um, the, we grew as a state um, by about 2.74 million people. Our growth rate is about 750 persons per day which are coming to Florida, which makes us the third largest state, um, the second in growth behind Texas, the ninth fastest growing state, um, having a growth rate of 14.6%, and the ninth in housing unit growth. So you could see that certain parts of Florida are exploding um, or have exploded over the last four uh, or last 10 years. 17 counties in Florida lost population uh, during the decade. All but three of these are landlocked and the population of these counties collectively shrank only by um, 17,700. So really, not a whole lot of, of, of loss when you consider um, three counties. Interesting to note 
Florida's growth comes from in migration and not organically, which means there are more deaths than there are births in Florida. So then there's a lot of people coming or moving um, to Florida. A couple of other things that uh, we want you to know that in terms of a di from a diversity perspective, Florida became more diverse. There's a diversity index. And so in 2010, um, based on the diversity index, we were 59.1. And this time around, we are 64.1. So that means we are a much more diverse state than we were um, 10 years ago. In comparison to the U.S. as a whole, the U.S. diverse index is 54.9 um, in 2010, and today it is 61.1. So Florida ranks 10th um, in terms of diversity. Hispanics make up 26.5% uh, of Florida's population um, versus 23% um, for the nation, and uh, w the fastest growth, um, one of the fastest growth um, communities was the Hispanic community, where they had a 34.9 growth um, rate during the last decade. A um, African American had 15 point, make up 15.1 percent, and the growth rate there was 8.2 percent. Florida continues to get a little bit older as well. Um, the median age rose from 40.7 um, to 41.8. And that goes back to the notion of in-migration as well. And so we can look at where um, Florida is growing significantly. But before we go there, uh, just want you to know that there are more young people overall in Florida in 2010 than in 2010. The school, school age population is expected to rise by 160,000 in this next decade. So the biggest increases um, in terms of population um, occurred in the following counties. And that's important for the business community as you as businesses think about where they're going to allocate resources what type of resources they're are gonna allocate um, based upon who is coming to those communities and the makeup of those communities. So the biggest population increase in the state of Florida was Osceola County, and that's a 44.7% growth increase, followed by St. John's at 43.9, um, then followed by Sumter, at 38.9, Walton County in, in, in Northwest Florida at 36.8, Lake County 29.3%, Orange County 24.8%, Santa Rosa County 24.2, Manatee County at 23.8, Nassau at 23.2, and Lee County at 23.8. Uh, percent. So you will notice that you had growth in many different parts of the state as well. Um, but you, the I-4 corridor is continuing to be a significant area of growth for the state. Um, so there are huge um, housing gains as well. For example, in Sumter County, you have 42 percent um, new um, construction in, in terms of that that occur um, during that pe period. St. John's County, 32.6%. Um, and so each one of those large counties with, with growth um, sort of reflects that there is going to be significant housing growth to accommodate all of the people that are coming to the state of Florida. Now, my colleague Kevin is going to walk you through the some of the terminology that we use in redistricting and um, some of the other components that are important as we think about redistricting and and how that process works um, as a legislative process. But as we mentioned before, 
if you are a business, you want to stay tuned to this process because um, based upon how these maps are drawn, it's also going to affect the the political tilt of the state as well. And, and all these numbers impact how much money the state is able to draw down from the federal government, whether it's for education, health care, transportation, um, broadband, and all of those infrastructure needs um, that occur in the state. So um, we will keep you keyed in to those issues. And so at this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Kevin, to walk you through um, some some of the more particulars as it relates to redistricting. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. And a good morning, everyone. As Ron was mentioning with the redistricting, this happens every 10 years. And right now, this legislative session for the 2022, beginning in January, is going to be the very beginning of that. The legislature has already begun meeting and talking about the redistricting. But I wanted to go over some important terminology and some of the requirements, both on the federal and state level, that the legislature must be able to consider and incorporate when drawing their redistricting maps. First, let's learn about the terminology. So with when you hear the word reapportionment, one thing that is nuanced and different than that from redistricting is that this is dealing with the enumeration of U.S. congressional seats and the uh, in dealing with the way that the number of seats available for representation by each state. That's different from redistricting, which is actually dealing with the location and shape of each of the legislative districts, both Senate and House, along with the congressional districts for that particular state. So moving into the federal redistricting laws and requirements, some important items that the legislature must consider when moving forward are Article One, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, this gives the legislatures the task of determining how these congressional elections are, are to be held and when. And the 14th Amendment of the, United, of the U.S. Constitution, more specifically Section 2, provides that a state's number of representatives in the House will be determined based on the state's population. This is also very commonly heard as one person, one vote. And this is something that is also incorporated in some of the state's constitution under the 2012 redistricting. Um, amendment that passed in 2012. Also, an important landmark legislation on the federal level was the Voting Rights Act. This was passed in 1965 by and signed by President LBJ. It aimed to overcome the legal barriers of the state and local levels from preventing people from exercising the right to vote as guaranteed under the 15th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. In the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, prohibits a state from denying the right to vote on account of race or color through voting qualification or prerequisites. And this was an important foundational aspect that led to some of the, the Florida's constitutional redistricting changes that were made in 2012. Now, moving into the Florida Constitution, the big items that the legislature are tasked to keep in mind are Article 3, Section 16, which provides directives and timelines for establishing new districts. Hence, uh, for this year, the 2022 election or session is going to be when they are required. They are required to do that after each decennial census report comes out. And Article 3, Section 20, which deals more specifically with congressional redistricting, um, and Article 3, or Article 3, Section 21 deals with the legislative redistricting. As I mentioned before, in Florida, 2012 brought in new constitutional requirements that were approved by voters to reform the redistricting process. These new sections added the both section 20 and 21. And more specifically, no apportionment plan or individual district shall be drawn with the intent to favor or disfavor a political party or incumbent. And the district shall be as nearly equal in population as practical. Districts shall be compact and districts shall be, where feasible, utilize existing political and geographical boundaries. That deals with what the legislature commonly uh, references as the compactness and those considerations. Some of the changes in that that the legislature have been discussing and making sure that they hold the proper standards for are both tier one and tier two standards. And the important thing to note about the tier one and two tier standards is that 
the tier one standards take priority over the tier two standards, while each tier standards are equal amongst each other. And as I mentioned before, the tier one standards deals with no apportionment or plan or individual shall be drawn for the intent to favor or disfavor an incumbent or political party. And tier two deals with more of the compactness and equal representation of one person, one vote. When you move into some of the Florida statutes that the legislature are required during the legislative session to consider, chapter eight of the Florida statute defines the technical boundaries of the congressional districts. Chapter 10 defines the boundaries of the Senate and House districts. And chapter 11 defines, uh, provides that the legislature use the most recent census for apportionment purposes. Um, and then also the legislature is going to be required to make sure that this stays open and transparent. One of the things that's been very difficult for this, ele this legislative session is in 2012, when the legislature met to do the redistricting process, they had the opportunity to be able to travel the state and get public input due to the impacts of COVID-19. That has not been available, but any citizen business or entity is able to watch this on the Florida channel, follow it as we do here at Gunster, and also be able to provide any input to your local elected officials. Now, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Joanna and kind of go over both the timeline and exactly where we're at and what's left for the legislature to consider before the end of the next legislative session. Thank you, Kevin. As Kevin mentioned, we are moving along in this timeline uh, for redistricting. And of course, you'll see at the top of the timeline that we've received the census data from uh, the US government. Uh, that was of course delayed due to COVID. And so therefore the state's ability to uh, analyze that data and to, um, to get it to the legislative committees that will handle the redistricting and reapportionment uh, was a little bit delayed as well. But what's important to remember is that by our constitution, um, that we are required to have these districts uh, voted out and established uh, during the session and so that they are ready in order for the uh, candidate qualifying that comes in June. And so um, the goal for the legislature, of course, is to complete this work during the upcoming session in January. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where we are in the process right now. Uh, so the Senate Redistricting Committee, the Senate and House both have their own um, full redistricting committee, and then they have subcommittees that fall under those, one to handle the congressional districts and one to handle the House and Senate districts. Those committees have all met now uh, at least once. The Senate subcommittees addressing the congressional seats and the um, the Senate and House seats have now met for the first time this past week during the special session and committee week. Um, you know, the Senate and House sometimes approach their work a little bit differently, and this is an example of that, where the Senate has focused a majority of the background information in the main reapportionment committee, and then now the actual overview of, of the map drawing um, and analysis of the initial Senate maps, that's all taken place in the subcommittee first after those maps were released. In the House, they've, they've handled that process a little bit differently. They've had their subcommittees meet and the full committee meet as well. And they've, they've all essentially had uh, very similar presentations each time they've met. So they're all hearing the same information and, and having a lot of similar conversations. But um, the Senate committee this week released their staff drawn maps. And that's an important part of, of you know, moving along the process. So in the committee weeks that happened this past week, those maps were discussed in detail and presented to the senators. Uh, I have to say that the overall commentary about the initial staff maps 
there are four for the congressional seats and four for the Senate seats, uh, was that they were very well received uh, by both members on the Republican and Democratic side of the House. And so there was not a lot of um, negative commentary about them during the committee meetings. Um, Several members ha at this point have been drawn into the same districts in a few of those maps, as can happen. Um, staff was directed not to take into account any addresses of uh, sitting legislators. And so, um, you know, that, that can happen when they are looking at redrawing district lines. And um, we did hear some testimony from members of the public, uh, in particular, the, the person who is the president of the League of Women Voters, they're a group that's quite often very engaged in the redistricting process, um, commented and, and asked that they uh, do some, some different analysis, a functional analysis is what it's called, of each of the districts in each of the maps. Uh, the staff's response to that request was that you know they're not required to and they don't know that it's necessary based on the population changes in the state. Um, so it remains to be seen whether that will, will happen between now and the next round of meetings. But one of the biggest concerns that was raised in the Senate meetings about the Senate maps in particular uh, was the, in the, the congressional, the splitting of Tampa Bay for a minority majority district um, in the past, this is, has been done because it was required by the court in order to have a minority majority district. And uh, several members raised the point that with the population growth, they don't know that you need to, um, to take part of Tampa and go across the bay into St. Pete in order to achieve that same uh, minority majority district. So. There were a few members that asked that that be looked into a little bit further by staff. So I expect that we'll be hearing more about that in their next meeting when they return. Um, so uh, we've mentioned that the public can participate and it is a little bit more challenging this round uh, versus the last redistricting as Kevin mentioned because the legislature determined that with the COVID challenges that they are not going to travel the state uh, as they have in the past to seek public input. I will tell you that some of your local uh, legislators are intending to have meetings at home in their districts. So be on the lookout for those notices if you're interested in participating or attending one. Uh, I believe some members are also planning to hold virtual events with their constituents. As a member of the public, you also have the ability uh, to submit your own map. Um, there is a redistricting website. It's www.florida, all spelled out, redistricting.com. And you can go there and pull information uh, about the the history of our state's redistricting, as well as the existing maps and past maps and the census data, that's all there. But you also have the ability to review the maps that have been submitted by legislative staff, as well as members of the public. And you can submit your own map and you can go in and you know do the exact work that the staff is doing if this is Something that's interesting to you, I definitely recommend you check out the website. Uh, you can also find a link to that website through the Florida Senate website and the Florida House website uh, if you have trouble finding it. So um, the, the Senate chair, Chair Rodriguez, made the point that any member of the public who wants to comment or edit a map or submit a map themselves you must also sign a, an affidavit, if you will, that um, includes your name and uh, whether you have received any compensation for your work product. And this is in, in direct response to uh, past issues that the legislature, specifically the Senate, ran into with uh, paid political entities influencing uh, the map drawing over in the Senate. And so 
they're trying to be fully transparent about where these maps are coming from when it comes to whether it's the members submitting a map themselves or uh, an individual in the public. So um, keep that in mind if you do decide you would like to submit a map. Um, I also wanted to tell you the House staff has not yet released any of their maps. I think they're, they're just a, a bit behind the Senate in that process. I do expect that they will probably have some ready for that first round of, of December um, committee meetings. And of course, they've got uh, the ability to do that work through the January and, and February session as well. Um, I can take a minute and tell you about some of the seats, the intrigue that has come up in a few of the, the maps that the Senate released. In particular, um, you know, we're, we're potentially going to have a new congressional district in the center of Florida. It, it's anticipated and based on the maps that have been released that that's going to be around that I-4 corridor, probably a little closer to the Orlando side of I-4. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, the 14th Congressional District that's currently held by a Democrat, Congresswoman Kathy Castor, it includes all of Tampa in its current form. It's a very safe Democratic seat. And uh, Joe Biden very handily won that district when he ran for president. But under the Senate drafts, um, President Biden would have only won with 51% of the vote compared to 58. So this could create a swing district for Republicans in the 2022 midterms, um, which could be you know, a very interesting turn for that particular district. I think that's been fairly safe uh, Democratic seat for a number of years. In terms of the state legislative seats, uh, and in a little bit of intrigue there, uh, down in the Miami area, Republican Ileana Garcia's Senate District, District 37, it looks like under a few of the maps would be easier for Democrats to retake. Um, and then in Republican Jason Broder's Senate District, which is more in, in the center of the state, Seminole County based, that's Senate District 9, that would become a little bit harder for Republicans to maintain as well. Um, that population demographic there has definitely gotten a little bit more blue over the years. And so this seat would, would and the way it's drawn, the staff have dipped further into Orange County, which is bluer than Seminole in many places. And it does give Democrats the opportunity to really secure that seat. And, uh, and it's been considered a swing seat for a number of years now, although Republicans have continued to maintain it. There's some speculation that under the Senate maps, the Tallahassee-based seat for Democrats, uh, Senator Loran Osley could be in play. It uh, moves a little further to the right in the drawing of the map. And so it would potentially pull in some additional Republican voters and, and could make that a swing seat. Additionally, uh, we've got a few incumbents that have been drawn into the same seat, as I mentioned, in the Ocala area in District 8. We've got Senator Dennis Baxley and Senator Keith Perry. They're both Republicans who uh, have been drawn into the same district. And down in the Palm Beach, Boca area, we have Senator Lori Berman and Senator Tina Polsky, also both Democrats, who've been drawn into the same seat. Uh, Senator Berman was quoted this week as, as saying, you know, it's quite early and I'm not concerned and certainly I'll run in whatever seat um, that I'm drawn into. And I think that that's how a lot of the members feel right now is that the process is very early on and that there's still some time to go. So what we expect to happen in, in, in the Senate in particular at the December committee meetings, uh, which begin on November 29th and, and go into the first week of December, um, that the Senate committees will 
discuss and and debate their map in the subcommittee and then they will likely be voting out what goes to the full redistricting committee for the full committee's consideration and i certainly expect that the the house will be moving along in the process as well um, i think we have a question so ron i'll just pause for a minute and and we can look at that question Sure. So the question is, what is a minority majority district? Um, and so uh, I'll take a stab at it. A minority majority district is a district where you have um, a minority population um, that it makes up the majority of the district. So, for instance, in Florida, um, African-American or blacks make up a minority population in Florida. So if you have a majority, a, a district that is comprised of primarily African-Americans, then that is a minority majority district. Same thing would occur with um, Hispanics in, in a district that you have a majority of Hispanics in, in a district. And so you also have access seats um, where you have sort of uh, the ability of, of a minority population, someone who has minority descent to be able to um, um, attain that seat based upon the makeup of the seat from a from a population perspective. I don't know if uh, Joanna or Kevin, you want it to add anything else. No, Ron, that was right on. I, the only thing I would add is, is it's specifically one where that minority would have the ability by 50% plus one. Yeah, I, I, and you may have said that. <laughs> but. Yep, that is, that is correct. Uh, so just to add a little more um, color to, to all of this, when you think about all of this population growth, um, you know, the number of seat, seats stay static, right? There's 120 seats. There's 40 um, seats in the Senate. So 120 seats in the Florida House, 40 seats in the, state, in the state Senate. So that means that as the population grows, then the number of people that are represented by the member, by an individual member, also grows as well. Um, so that's something that um, uh, people keep in mind, need to keep in mind. So when we were talking earlier about the where the growth occurs, it also impacts the strength of the delegation, right? So if, as we have seen growth and we see growth occurring, where that growth occurs will also impact how many members will serve that particular part of the state. And, and so therefore that increases the ability for that community to move their issues um, in Tallahassee as a community. So I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, so when we think about the villages, right, they grew by 39% um, since 2010. They went from 93,000 people to 130,000 people, the census, which makes them the, the fastest growing um, metro area, area in the state. And so you combine that with Sumter, Marion, and Lake, you combine those three areas and they become like the fastest growing area in the state. So therefore you, you would naturally think that from a legislative perspective that they're going to have much more influence um, in the legislative process. So if you're a business and you're thinking about where do you want to locate businesses, like where, what type of businesses do you want to locate um, in that part of the state based upon who lives there, right? So you just think about the villages encompasses 60,000 homes along with 54 golf courses, right? It has uh, um, three town centers and four, 60 uh, pickleball ball courts, right? So you think about where are you going to move healthcare facilities? Where are you going to build healthcare facilities? What type of healthcare facility would you build there? Um, you think about what the populations from an income perspective 
um, is, where they, they fit on that spectrum. And that gives you a sense of uh, the, the buying capacity of, of that particular community um, in that particular region. So as you think about, you know, reapportionment and redistricting, um, you can take it outside of the political context and think about it from a business context and an economic context, and that helps businesses uh, prepare for the future as as they think about their own growth strategies as as a company um, moving forward. You know, one of the other um, high growth areas in the state is Osceola County, as we talked about, with 44.7% growth um, in the state. Um, and Osceola, if you know where it is, it is sort of right outside of the Disney area, right? And um, so you think about Kissimmee. Um, and so all of that area is connected to the Orlando area. It's, it's also connected to, to um, Lake County, right? It's, it's sort of adjacent to Lake County and so forth. So as Joanna talked about where that congressional district is, you can, you can sort of picture in your mind that that is a perfect place for that district to sit simply because of the population growth there. And, and, and it's not until, I always say, it's not until you go through one or two election cycles that you begin to see the actual um, performance of those districts, right? Because I think incumbents generally have a better shot at, at winning elections, even if they move slightly outside of their district. Um, they have, have a, a slightly better chance because people get to know them as they as they engage the public um, in doing their job. But once you get past that cycle and you get into a second cycle, then you begin to see sort of what influenced the the new people who have come into the district um, and 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 the 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 varying political philosophies that exist within the, within a district outside of things that can happen that could could, could have a, a big impact on how people perceive um, a particular party or a particular um, member uh, of the legislature. Right, I'll just jump in. So um, one of the big things I would like to highlight just to kind of galvanize what Ron was sharing was, if you look at this population growth map here, this is also a heat map on the growth that Ron was talking about here in Florida for that type of investment for businesses. So not only looking at it under the paradigm of a political mind or, or frame, but also looking at it as far as population growth and a business investment point of view. And as you can see here, where it is more blue is where the growth is, is highest. And the Ye the yellow is where the least amount of growth is in the state. And so with that being said, that is something that is very important to continue to follow and the information that's been provided and the data that the legislature are reviewing right now does have a business implication as much as it does on a political for how they are going to draw their lines, but more importantly on what the trends are here in Florida and what areas of Florida are seeing the most significant amount of economic growth along with that population growth. Hey, Ron, yeah, I just I wanted to, to that's right. I just wanted to add on to uh, your commentary and, and note that for the first time in our state, we've seen Republican voter registrations surpass the Democratic registrations. So to go along with what you're saying, you know, some of these districts, uh, especially this new con congressional district, it could be very, very interesting to see the way the first couple uh, elections play out because, you know, your voter registration is one thing, but your district performance is not always the same. And we've seen that before um, in especially a lot of these swing, swing seats. So... Uh, Republicans are quite pleased with this uh, advantage they they perceive that they now have but um, you know along with that I will note that 
you've seen an, in, an increase in independent registrations as well. So you've got a lot of voters out there that aren't going to either one of the major parties. They're sticking with the independent uh, label. Yeah, and that's an interesting point that you bring up, Joanna, in that when you think about the registrations overall, it's, it's almost like a third, a third across the board in terms of um, party registrations between Democrats, Republicans, and, and independents. And so that always creates a headache for those who are running for office because you, you don't always know how the independents are going to to, to act or react in a in a um, general election um, for a particular seat. So so that's an interesting um, dynamic that, that we're going to see. And then the other truth is that the registration doesn't always um, reflect the actual will. You think about you know for you know Florida has just become a Republican majority majority state, quote unquote, right, from a from a party registration. Well, when you look at the last 25 years of rule in the state of Florida, uh, Republicans have had full control of the House, the Senate, um, and the executive branch um, of the state of Florida. So that's not always um, a, a, a perfect line um, indicator of, of how the state will um, react, particularly in, in statewide elections, um, as, as we think about it. Um, so one of the things that, that I talked about a little bit earlier was sort of the housing gains. And you think about where those housing gains are, and um, depending upon which county it is, right, and, and who's coming to those counties will impact education. Um, we saw that there could be a growth of 160,000 um, new students in the next decade. And so depending on the county, when you think about Sumter County with a 42% home gain, does that really mean that you're going to have a 42% growth in, in, in um, the school system in Sumter County? Um, so that's a question that, that uh, I'm sure that that county is going to try to figure out based upon the the current population and the trends that they find there. Um, whereas in Osceola County, where you have a 20.7% growth in, in, in um, gain in terms of homes, I would assume that you're going to have a lot more um, school-age students in Osceola than you would, say, in Sumter County or, or, or maybe Lake County, simply because of the, the current makeup of, of the population um, there. So that goes into the reapportionment and, and how dollars are spread uh, across the state. You know, um, those census block, the census block information becomes extremely important in terms of how much money um, comes to a particular area based upon um, how a how sen a, a, a particular area performs in the census, right? Um, so when you think about healthcare funding, you think about education funding, you think about transportation funding, and all the funding that is is sort of a partnership between the federal government and the state government. That linkage really comes down to um, let's make sure that we are spending the money where the actual there is actual need and that information be, that information from an objective perspective is based upon the census data um, that has been collected um, through this process let's see if we have any more questions uh, uh, from the public um, at this time for those who are who are watching the process so um, I know that we are going to talk about the actual map next time, um, but based upon your experience, um, each one of you, Kevin and, and Joanna, um, how intense does this process get between members, right? As, as, as at some point it becomes a competitive process between members uh, in recognition that, um, you know, certain districts might be better 
for for a member simply because of their positions on issues, um, uh, their their personal demographic information, um, and and their familiarity with a particular di district, right? So, based upon your experience, can you share a little bit of of of, of that from from what you have seen? Yes. Well, um, for me personally, one of the big items that I have found most interesting when it comes to that heightened sense of focus and then eventual um, tension that you begin to see is actually, and you referenced it earlier, among the individual county delegations and what type of strength or dynamics may change through the course of certain counties having new representation or those lines being redrawn. A good example of that is down in Miami-Dade where there is significant diversity among a very small land region, which is the smallest changes in the redistricting process can actually have significant impacts on who all is able to represent that a constituency within a certain area or neighborhood, along with what type of voice the delegation itself would have up in the legislature on a for the next 10 years. Another item I find very interesting is on the reverse end, when you deal with more of the rural areas of Florida, where you see population growth similar to this one, where um, Polk County has seen population growth along with the Lee County area, and but the Heartland doesn't have the same level of population growth. So these districts geographically change significantly, which then may incorporate new counties than what that member it, um, may or may not have seen or been familiar with on a constituency level. So the elected officials who are going to be running again versus the candidates that are going to be running in these new seats, they have to re-educate themselves and understand what the constituency, the constituency needs are. And they have to do that in very short order and do it while managing another uh, regular session if they are an incumbent. So, it, so it, to your point, Ron, it does create a lot of tension and a lot of, um, a lot of incentive for them to really pay attention to this the same way that the voters are paying attention to it. I agree, and I also feel like, you know, I think on the surface, members are, are usually very respectful and very cordial with one another, but certainly uh, they will try to find the the district drawn to a, a way that will allow them to uh, to stay in their home and not have to move. Um, that's something that certainly some of them will have to consider when looking at the current districts and the new district lines. And um, I think we have a question about the new congressional district and whether it is expected to be in the Lakeland area. I think that is being uh, bantered about and that it is a possibility that it could end up with Lakeland being a, a central part of it. Um, there's a, a number of members that are in and around that area um, where you know they could be terming out soon that you may see express some interest in running for it. But one member in particular that I believe has, has already announced his intention to run um, is Representative Anthony Sabatini. And uh, I don't know, Kevin or Ron, if there are others that you, you know of, but I know that he's already, I believe, filed his paperwork. Yeah, I think that's correct. I think the paperwork has been filed. I think other members are, are sort of taking a, a wait and see approach to see what, what it will actually look like before um, they actually get in it. And, um, um, and to see if they would be a good fit for, for that particular district. It's, it's, inter it's interesting to see how even some of the other districts that are, are not new are changing, right? And so they essentially become new districts um, for, for individuals who are running for them. And so, so um, it, I, it's, it's gonna be in, an interesting dynamic um, in that. The other thing that I was thinking about as 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 uh, both you and Kevin were talking is the the geographic diversity 
of the district, right? Um, I remember my district in South Florida wasn't more than seven miles um, long, right? And, and not more than maybe two and a half miles wide, right? Um, but I had like four cities in my district. Um, and you compare that to some other districts that have, have you know, nearly 100 miles um, in that di district, and you have several counties that are part of that district. And so when you think about um, the, the allocation of, of, of people and then resources across the state, that impacts um, the ability for, for, for legislators to actually um, perform for, um, for their districts. Right. And so that plays a role in that. And I think that um, in addition to members thinking about their own fate, they're also thinking about how will the district be able to to perform uh, moving forward um, based upon which um, counties they are connected with, who is their neighbor as a city. Right. Do they do the cities line up in terms of what they are what they are traditionally seeking um through the legislative processes so so those are some things that i think that members are also thinking about um throughout this process let's see if we have any other questions um from the audience i see joanna you have covered the congressional question um let's see if there are any others all right um so any other thoughts on, on, on that issue in terms of the, the allocation of resources um, as we think about them um, uh, within geographic areas and particular needs of the state? When we think about if you have environmental needs, for instance, um, delegation from a particular area strong enough to, to address issues that come from that deal with certain environmental issues that are happening back home. Do they have what what I call the juice in order to to um, move things from a legislative perspective um, to see to address those things? And so, see what your thoughts are on that. To to add to that point or to comment on that, one of the things I would uh, kind of point out is a there has been on a federal level and also the governor DeSantis has been very focused on both environmental restoration here in the state, along with resiliency issues that also overlay with a lot of infrastructure incentives and programs that the federal government has been focused on. I believe that some of these more rural districts uh, are going to be incorporating more coastal communities and are going to be incorporating more uh, demographics that are going to be focused on individual city infrastructure needs like wastewater treatment, uh, converting their septic to sewer, and also addressing resiliency needs on a natural resource basis and making sure that the proper protections are there. I believe that uh, there's going to be a big focus both on spending for this upcoming legislative session, along with understanding what these infrastructure needs may be in areas of the state that these members may not have had the same focus on the last 10 years. So it will be very important for them to be communicating with and learning about issues both inside and outside of their district, especially here in the Senate. Yeah, to that point, Kevin, it's a great opportunity for y'all as uh, as business leaders and community leaders to get out there and meet these members and ex and show them what you do, and um, and help them understand your needs as a a business owner and as a community. Uh, I I really believe, especially in terms of infrastructure, as an area of important focus for our state and our continued economic. Um, you know, success. Excellent. So we are coming to the end of our session this morning. And um, as a reminder, our next session will be in January, where we will talk about um, 
the latest news related to redistricting. We will focus on the maps, talk about what those maps look like and and um, who's being impacted and how. And then our final session will occur in March, and there we will go into deep detail about the maps as the maps will be finalized by then, and then talk about the next steps. There is usually um, legal challenges to these maps, and so we will see if that's going to be the case this time around as well. And so we will keep you updated on those types of things. Um, Joanna, Kevin, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make closing comments, and then I'll make closing comments, and then we will sign off. Well, I just appreciate the time today with all of you and look forward to uh, visiting again with you in January. And I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and enjoy the upcoming holidays as well. And I would like to thank everyone for putting the same level of focus as we are on this redistricting process and also recognizing the fact that this is a continually evolving process and will continue to move forward into the new year. So definitely, if there's any questions that you all have, do not hesitate to reach out to our group, and we'll be more than glad to try to address any specific items that directly impact your business or your or your community. Other, other than that, I hope everyone has a, thank, a happy Thanksgiving and look forward to the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Joanna. I want to thank both of you for the time and effort that you put in in, in preparing for this and um, and for your informative commentary today. And uh, we um, want to express our gratitude to you, our audience, for engaging with us this morning. And as was noted by Kevin, if you have questions um, that were not answered or questions that you would like to pose that come to you afterwards, feel free to email us. And, and, and let us know, and we will try to get a response back out to you um, uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, as a reminder, we will have a follow-up to this uh, part two in January, and so you will be receiving that information, and then we'll have a, the part three, which will occur in March. Thank you once again for, for joining us this, this morning. Have a fantastic Thanksgiving and holiday season. And um, stay plugged in, stay engaged, um, because that's the way we make our communities better. Thank you once again for joining us today.